There's a relatively little known type of medieval helmet that was only around for about a generation. And I think it's particularly interesting because it first appears on the great seal of Richard the Lionheart himself. This particular type of helmet, you might notice, is flat topped. Nobody's quite sure where the design actually comes from, but it's possible that the changes in the technology were making sheets of steel that are bigger more possible. The nasal on what's called the Spangen helm or the Norman nasal helm has actually been widened to cover the whole of the face. Again, nobody's really certain why the faceplate was adopted. I personally think it might be something to do with cavalry combat, lance to lance combat, which means that somebody's gonna be going for your face. That's the big obvious target when you've got a lance and you're galloping towards another cavalry man. The face is particularly visually attractive. The eyes as well, you look at those. There's another thought, which is that this faceplate is also designed to protect the cavalry man against missile fire. Again, people are going to be aiming arrows or bolts at your face, and this gives you some protection. But it also reduces your vision and your mobility and your hearing to a large extent. So at the same period that we see high cavalry, if you like, the, the highest nobility, kings, princes, lords, wearing this kind of helmet, we also see a lot of cavalrymen, obviously knights, wearing open face helmets. And as usual, there are types of helmets that are earlier uh, that are seen in illustrations at the same time as this kind of helmet. Some people have suggested that the flat top of this kind of helmet is poor because it means that shots don't get deflected. Well, if you think about it from a cavalry perspective, it's only other cavalry that are gonna be hitting you from above. The foot are gonna be hitting you from underneath or in front. So that's going to be protected by this, but also, it's very rare to get a direct straight chop on the top of the head. You're more likely to get it angled. And as you know, an angle of armor, if a, if a sword hits this angle like this, this is actually going to be stronger than a straight plate like this. This joint itself is going to take quite a lot of impact. So as long as somebody doesn't hit you square on there or square on there, this acts as quite a protective barrier ridge if you think about it that way. I'm going to try this helmet out because I haven't really worn this kind of helmet before. I'm a bit concerned that the helmet might do that for example when you're riding that might actually tilt forwards and I suspect that any impact low down on the chin here would rotate the helmet forwards and this would smash into your face in part but of course armour doesn't stop you getting hit what it does is it actually spreads the blow. You'll notice I've got very narrow eye slots here. They don't have any of the later period innovations which curve the eye slot outwards to stop anything going in there. So if something slid up, it could catch and go into the eye. So as always, this is armor in progress. This is not the ultimate kind of armor, but it was pretty good for the time. And if King Richard the Lionheart in 1198 was happy to have this shown on his great seal and interestingly his earlier seal had him in a conical helmet so this was the height of fashion we see this in illustrations from around 1220 1230 later so perhaps king richard the lionheart was a fashion and armor innovator which is quite likely given that he was a fairly famous person throughout the whole of christendom now this helmet obviously you could just wear it but you need protection on your head and what i use for that is a padded coif padded coif c-o-i-f and i'm not sure how to pronounce that word and i'm sure that like many french loan words in english it was deliberately or maybe not deliberately ignorantly mispronounced and became said in a different way so i call them coifs This is the padded garment. 
It's a thinly padded uh, balaclava, if you like, although balaclava comes from a later period of, uh, of battle. They wouldn't have called it a balaclava back then, because that comes from the Crimean War. This is also quite warm and it is quite protective. It's not super padded and I would normally wear mail over the top of this. I would normally wear full mail uh, over this gambeson, but just for the purposes of what I'm doing today, I'm, I'm not bothering to wear mail. It adds another level of complexity to the tests. So I'm just going to wear this and I'll show you how it sits and fills in spaces around the shoulders. Do you can see how that cuts down elements of the neck a little bit and creates quite a bullet shaped uh, in later periods anyway, quite a bullet shaped protection of the head. And with the helmet, which I'll put on now, it actually gives some face protection here. And you know, I said the, the helmet goes back towards the face. Well, this actually helps give it some kind of padding so that if it does tip back towards the face, it doesn't actually smash directly into your teeth and your mouth. Um, it probably would with a hard enough blow, but it gives it some kind of, uh, of padding. And I'm also going to strap it under my chin, which we see quite often. Uh, helmets obviously need to be strapped down if you're going to wear them practically. In movies, they're not strapped down because it's just easier. But for real practice, uh, which is what I'm going to do later, you need it to be properly strapped. Now, we don't know how the strapping on these helmets actually work. This helmet was made for me by Graham of Greenleaf and a lot of it's conjectural. The brass fanciness on the front I think is quite likely. People love this kind of thing. The strapping arrangement as well. This is just a simple chin strap. It's not inconceivable that there would have been a two-point strap to stop rotation but I have no evidence of that so I'm going to try it with just this simple strap. Now I have to adjust the helmet because obviously if the helmet is like that I can't see and if the helmet doesn't fit on my head properly it's going to be quite difficult to ride in and this is going under here. I'll do it quite tight again comfort is not really a, a thing when you're wearing some armour you want to survive you can see how it probably needs to go even tighter because there's a little bit of sideways movement here but I can see reasonably well out of it. The, the eye slots which are about a centimetre, maybe half an inch thick, about as thick as the side of my finger, actually give me quite a lot of vision. And if I had mail, this would be filled in with the mail. The mail would add a certain amount of bulk to it as well. So. It's going to be really interesting to see how this works when you're high up on a horse. So I'm going to use one of my biggest horses, Talos. He is dramatically bigger than a medieval war horse, particularly of this period, might be. So it's going to be an extreme test. And one of the concerns is I won't be able to see down to the ground, see anything that's on the ground. Good boy. Likely I'd put a lot of this on before I got on the horse, um, but for me right now, I thought I'd just try it. Good training for him to learn to stand still. Right, that's the padded coif that I would normally have mail over. One could point this down to the arming jacket to make sure it didn't flare up, uh, but you can see how it fits. Now the helmet. Well, it's gone on. He's standing still nicely, which is good. Always helps. Well-trained horse, which war horses should be very well trained. The issue is going to be how tight do I make it? Mm. Ah, now, first thing I notice, you can't actually see. I can see the horse if I do that. 
I cannot actually see where the reins are. Now I can see the top of his head when he brings his head up. But for the purposes of riding, you actually can't see your hands or your reins. So you need to be very aware of what you're actually doing. You need to be a good rider or you need an exceptionally well-trained horse. And obviously weight changes what the signal is that you give to the horse. So the instructions you can give to a horse are many. You can lean, for, lean, lean forwards, lean back, lean to one side, put more weight in this stirrup or this stirrup. You could twist your body. And obviously you've got your hands and your legs. So if your legs go back, I can ask him to back up. Walk on. Good boy. And you have to be able to do that without really seeing your own body because the thing with this helmet is I now can't see much at all. Just to give you an idea, I can see roughly, unless I actually look down, if I'm riding with my head up, I can see probably, I can see the floor about 30 feet away, maybe 10, 15 yards away. I have to look down. Obviously I can look down, but it becomes quite heavy if you look down you can feel the weight on the back of your head and you can see the the strain so balancing your head with a big helmet like this is actually quite important i imagine you'd build up some significant muscles in your neck if you were wearing this kind of helmet or a heavier one in fact because later period helmets are much heavier than this um, for any length of time now let's move him on so good boy walk on it's very easy the issue is going to be seeing things on the ground because I can't actually see. You see the tips of his ears. So you have to remember what's on the ground below you. If there's anything pops up sideways, I'd have to keep my vision going. It's basically anywhere from here to here and back, I can't really see. And I can't hear very well either. I am vulnerable, I'm heavily armored. It would be difficult to kill me with a blow, assuming I had the rest of my armor on. But I am very vulnerable from perspective of actually seeing and hearing anything. I can hear my own breath, it's reflecting off the faceplate. I can see forwards. I would need support behind me. And that's exactly how cavalry actions evolved. This man, the man in the heavy kit, is actually quite vulnerable. A bit like combined arms today. A tank never goes into battle without support exactly the same as a knight. A knight never goes into battle without other people to support him in his endeavours. Let's do a little bit at more speed and then I'll pick up a weapon and try hitting something. Good boy. All right, let's trot you on. The helmet's staying on perfectly well. Uh, I'm doing what's called a sitting trot. It's very medieval and it's more or less staying on my face in the right place and enabling me to see where I'm going to be going, but not where I am. <laughs> Let's try a canter now. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Yes, again, the canter is fairly easy. I can feel the effort. Let's pick up a lance now and try and hit something. A thing you may not realize about me holding the lance is I actually can't see where I'm holding it. So I had to look to see roughly where I need to hold it, which is about there. And so the lance would need to be given to you in a particular way. Obviously this is very light. I'm just going to use it as practice, but I actually can't see my own arm. I can see a little tiny piece of the lance uh, or the spear in this case, probably. So for me, the most obvious awkward thing about this helmet is, is the lack of vision. So I need to see where the lance is. Now with squires and people helping you, that becomes easier. But I can already feel the, it's not claustrophobia exactly, but you are enclosed in the steel and I'm becoming kind of closed in a little bit. It's, um, it's like wearing an enormous hooded, jacket I suppose you start to hear yourself more than you're normally hearing just gonna try hitting this target just to get my eye in yeah it's not difficult I can see the target which is good so it's not particularly harder 
than a later period helmet, the helmet I joust in. Um, in fact, arguably it's slightly lighter, so probably easy to get used to, but it has the same effect. It restricts your vision to tunnel vision, really. So I'll do a few more runs at target at speed and uh, just a gentle canter, just to see what it's like. And I've noticed the helmet is slightly needs to be adjusted it slips around a bit which is interesting so I should do a run keeping an eye on where I am trying to keep my my sense of direction going come on The padding is slightly going down my face. As I start to heat up, I'm getting a bit sweatier inside this. Um, but with a little bit of practice, I don't think it would get in the way very much. Don't have a shield on either. So there's a lot of bits missing of this armor ensemble. The key takeaway is it might be protective, but it gives you tunnel vision. And it would make you focus on killing the other bloke but I think you could be sideswiped quite easily and taken out, which is possibly why the type of cavalry warfare was the close packed knee to knee charge. Because at least then, you know, you've got another bloke either side of you, unless you're at the ends, I suppose. And you're just gonna go forwards and hit the poor others at the other end of the lance. And that's your job. So, very practical helmet for a certain job, but it doesn't give you a lot of vision. But I'll use this a bit more and modify it perhaps and become quite used to it. Richard the Lionheart wearing this in battle. He's gonna be very focused on attack, not so much on defense. The armor itself is gonna defend him, but he's not gonna see what's going on here or here. He'd need his team around him to protect him from being stabbed in the back or hooked off the off the horse so knee to knee cavalry combat is partly to do with impact but also practically it protects your flanks from the vulnerabilities of this kind of early full face armor mm -hmm.